and the rest is... Uh, the rest is history. Yeah, accordion yeah. history. <laughs> okay, Gornabi, thanks a lot for speaking this morning, and I'll talk to you soon. Hey, you know, Corey, yeah. just now you're in your fourth year here. There is no rhyme or reason when you're finding everyone. This guy happened to mention someone, and you said, well, where'd you get that, or how did that happen? And just uh, like a detective, you're tracking down the leads. Yeah, I see it as more of a pain in the neck. I'm like, you know, what? <laughs> wait, 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 stop. What was that? Yeah, tell me again. <laughs> how can I find the person? Yeah. 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 Yep. Well, it's 11 o'clock in a snowy New York City here. You're listening to Talk Back, Talk Back, We and Thee with Maliki McCourt. I don't think the man needs any introduction. And Corey Kilgannon from the New York Times. No, Who not needs the singer. plenty of introduction. Not the not singer. Because you got something else again on Twitter just recently saying, Are you that Corey Kilgannon? I get it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. I get it all the time. All the tweets that are good. Yeah. Are meant for the other Corey Kilgannon. Yeah. <laughs> all the bad news. Send it your way. Right to me. Yeah, yeah. Right. So Speaking now, of young people. Well, we're going to line up our next guest at, uh, the, about the Sherlock Holmes, Holmes. And, and, and find out what is the fascination about this between movies and books and just the tours over in London and now here. Like, I, I'm always amazed that there's one fan club and you're telling me, oh, no, no, there's four or five and they're all. Well, there's hundreds, but I mean, and a lot of hundreds. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. They, they call them Scion. S C I O N Cyan Societies of kind of the granddaddy, and at least in in the U S, which is the uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, which is a group of about three hundred people. I mean, I kind of see it as a secret society. I know they don't call it that, but they have this meeting every January. It happened on Friday this yeah. year, and it's you know it's it's closed. It's only open to members and a few select people they invite, including the handful of people that they you know induct every year or you know invest into the um, yeah. into the group and it's you know they come up after after dinner and they're given a a shilling a, a traditionally a shilling for that's what a, a Sherlock Holmes uh, always threw a, threw a shilling to the Baker Street Irregulars with a collection of like urchins on Baker Street who would do his bidding and find out from the uh, different aspects of the un, of London underworld well you know uh, Arthur Conan Doyle uh, <coughs> was uh, his father was an Irishman and he was a uh, rather uh, smallish, uh, squattish, uh, kind of a stout man of a uh, red face and uh, <clears throat> and sort of not uh, not the aquiline build of the usual Sherlock Holmes we see in uh, in movies and so forth. And uh, he, uh, the first uh, Sherlock Holmes was based on his father, mm -hmm. uh, that Arthur Conan Doyle, and he was a small, fat man with a red face. And consequently, when we had uh, various other Sherlock Holmes, consequently, they've always had that, that aquiline face and that slim build and absolutely British and so on. But he was actually a small, squat Irish man. Right. So there Which we are. Which goes to, again to prove the Irish invented everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course according, we are. Yeah. Life right. according to yeah. Maliki. Right. Did yeah. it turn out good? Oh, yeah, we appropriate that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is uh, uh, Lindsay Fay, thank you for coming on and talking to us this morning. Lindsay Fay of the Baker Street Babes. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. So I'm, I'm building you up here, Lindsay. Uh, you know, um, all this kind of interest these days in Sherlock again, and it's, uh, and you guys have this great modern twist on something that, you know, kind of originated, you know, in the Victorian era in London. And just tell us about the babes and how that kind of came to be and what you guys, like how you do your own individual spin on it. Because what I saw on Thursday night at the costume ball that you guys arranged as part of the Sherlock, you know, weekend or, you mm -hmm. know, extended weekend was just like, you know, if you expect kind of a bunch of old staid people, you know, bookish, you know, studying the old texts. I mean, this was nothing like that this was like a costume ball where it wasn't just you know uh, you know kind of the deer stalker cap and the inverness cape it was like it was a there was a bunny rabbit there was you were a butterfly <laughs> i mean very with all with obscure references to all the, you know the canon of sherlock holmes uh, stories but just talk about how the babes came to be and what you got the kind of events that you guys do and the work that you do sure um the baker street babes were founded as uh the Internet's only all-female Sherlock Holmes podcast, and that was in the year 2010. Um, I actually also uh, am a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, and I have been um, for the past seven years, and I'm a member of the Adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes as well, which was the female um, Sherlockian society that sort of formed as a protest um, to the fact that the BSI, having been founded as um, sort of a men's um, <coughs> supper club, 
1934 by Christopher Morley, um, was not admitting um, women until the, the mid-90s, unfortunately. Um, so the Baker Street Babes, uh, during the year 2010, uh, Christina Menente, our founder, um, she wanted to put together a podcast with other young women who were really into Sherlock Holmes. And um, we all started interviewing various mystery authors. I myself am a mystery novelist. Um, I have written seven mystery novels uh, with G.P. Putnam. And uh, <clears throat> we essentially, we like to talk to authors who um, who have works out that have to do with Sherlock Holmes. Um, we very much enjoy talking to actors who have been involved with the BBC series and other incarnations of Sherlock Holmes. Um, our, our motto is essentially all Holmes is good Holmes. And we developed quite a following um, because of this podcast. Um, various members, um, we, there are 11 of us, and many of us actually came to Sherlock Holmes initially because we read the books when we were kids. So um, we actually are, are very much... Um, you know, in line with the irregulars in the sense that we know <laughs> a vast amount of minutia <laughs> um, about the books. But we also um, enjoy all of the sort of sillier incarnations um, that <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes has found himself in over the years, including, you know, anything from the great mouse detective uh, from Walt Disney to um, Asylum's version of Sherlock Holmes, uh, which uh, features, unfortunately, a, a Kraken and mechanical T-Rex. <laughs> So um, we sort of noticed that during the Baker Street Irregulars Weekend, which is just this wonderful sort of conference um, that goes on every January to celebrate the great detective's birthday, that all of these events, um, it, as marvelous as they are, were sort of um, insular in the sense that uh, they were all for us. They were all for us to just get together and nerd out about Sherlock Holmes. The BSI dinner, of course, is invitation only, and um, many of the rest of the, the events aren't. Um, pretty much all of the rest of them, anyone can attend. But they're all, you know, for Sherlockians. And um, the babes uh, started thinking about, you know, what could we do to give back to the community, ultimately? Um, so we started having this costume ball. This was our sixth year, and it's actually a charity auction. Uh, the primary function of it is for us to collect uh, items that have been sort of moldering in uh, various Sherlockian collectors' closets for decades and say, hey, um, it, there are people who would love to, to own this item. Can we auction it for charity? And for the last six years, we have been um, devoting this charity ball to, uh, to raising money for wounded soldiers, um, all in honor of Dr. John Watson, um, who served in the Second Afghan War, and he was wounded by a Jezail bullet. Um, he was <clears throat> deathly ill for a time, and when he came back to London, suffered um, from what we would now call a form of PTSD, and um, didn't have a lot of money, needed a roommate, and that's how he met Sherlock Holmes. Right. And the rest, of course, is history. But um, in I mean, the last six <laughs> years, we've raised uh, $37,000 for disabled American veterans, and we're really, really proud of that fact. Right. And I mean, so you're kind of saying just because you guys know how to party doesn't mean that, <laughs> you know, you don't, that you don't know your homes. Uh, and in fact, you know, a lot of these uh, obscure references of the, uh, that were in uh, the ball, like in the mm -hmm. costumes, you know, I went up to someone who was dressed as the Moor, the the, the Moor, uh, yes. <laughs> on the, the Heath, um, on uh, from uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, and that story. So these were kind of like not your basic. You, it took a little bit of um, uh, dragging out of like, what is the re for someone like me who is not I'm not so familiar with the canon, or what's the reference here, you know, and that stuff. So, but right. I, but but you know, it just it just points to the fact that you know you guys do know do re even if you got into Sherlock Holmes and the Conan Doyle canon through a movie or through a netflix series or whatever or even a podcast mm -hmm. you still everyone kind of does get into the literature and does read right well the majority of us actually got into it from the literature um the majority of of, of the babes um got into the books from the books um i've been a sherlockian since i was 10 um and i'm 37 now so it, i think that there are people who read the sherlock holmes mysteries and they read them for their outcomes, they read them for the wonderful atmosphere, and then they sort of walk away and say, yeah, I've read Sherlock Holmes. And then there are people who read the Sherlock Holmes mysteries and they uh, accidentally never stop reading the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, um, which is what several of us do. Um, two of the babes, in fact, uh, um, are doctors, and one of the babes, um, is a, she has her doctor, doctorate in um, 
Sherlockian film. She does comparative film studies. This is Dr. Ashley uh, Polishak. She is the only person in the world um, to actually hold a doctorate in Sherlockian studies. Um, the person who you were talking to at the ball, that was Dr. Maria um, Fleischach, and she, um, <laughs> as silly as it is to dress up as the Grimp and Meyer, um, for a costume party um, to raise money, you know, raising money for wounded soldiers, of course, is a is a serious subject. But um, yeah, we like to have a good time with it. But yeah, a lot of the references um, that you know we make to um, aspects of the canon are, you know, they're as obscure as, as anything that you would find in you know the most erudite of the journals that people put out to do with Sherlock Holmes. And as a matter of fact, a uh, I think most of us have contributed to the Baker Street Journal um, scholarly articles about about Sherlock Holmes, and most of us have contributed to other anthologies and essay collections of the literature on the subject. Do you have any strong? This is Malachi McCourt. Uh, yeah. Do you have any strong feelings about Moriarty? Strong feelings about Moriarty. Well, <laughs> I think that. Um, Okay. Professor Moriarty, of course, is the, the ubiquitous um, ultimate Sherlockian villain. Yes, I think I think that Moriarty is a curious figure um, as someone who has written a great many short stories um, and a large number of them Sherlock Holmes pastiches. Um, and pretty much the entire structure of the final problem, which of course is the is the case in which um, Moriarty vanquishes Sherlock Holmes and tosses him off the edge of a waterfall in Switzerland, um, was purportedly. It? Was that in Switzerland? In Switzerland yes, yes, yeah. at, yes, at the Reichenbach Falls. Yeah. Uh, essentially, essentially, that short story is written rather backwards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes arrives at, at Doctor Watson's house. Yeah. Starts starts shuttering all the windows, and um, he says to Watson, essentially, "Have you have you ever heard of my of my um, you know all time greatest nemesis, Professor Moriarty?" And Watson says, "Well, no," <laughs> 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 which is which is quite backwards. And then Moriarty himself, as a matter of fact, doesn't actually physically appear um, in the short story at all. This is all told from Dr. Watson's perspective. The only time you actually see Moriarty, he's, you know, rushing past them in pursuit on a, on a train. Yeah. Um, a lot of this is very much hearsay. So, um, so Conan Doyle, you know, there's, he it was such a wonderful, evocative writer, right? Um, when he starts talking about Moriarty as being the spider at the yeah. center of, of his web, who, you know, sort of sends out all of these filaments in every direction and infiltrates every aspect of London society, it's very, very vivid writing. But the short story is structured completely backwards, which I have always found <laughs> to be terribly entertaining. Um, well, how was it that... Uh as 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 uh, Sherlock Holmes solved every problem, vanquished every villain, so forth. But Moriarty was just continuous, never stopped. How was it he couldn't uh, get rid of him? Well, you know what's also curious about about Professor Moriarty is the fact that I think that uh, Professor Moriarty stands out in uh, in all of our imaginations as being the greatest Sherlock Holmes nemesis. However, he only really appears in two mysteries. Yeah, he appears peripherally in the novel The Valley of Fear, and he appears in the final problem, and yeah. then in uh, the adventure of the Empty House when Holmes returns to life, he says, "By the way, Watson, I am not really dead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my my sincere." Apologies, uh, I was kidding about the whole dead thing, and um, so of course Professor Moriarty is mentioned in that in that case. But yeah. otherwise, um, there's not hide nor hair of him in the rest of the Sherlock Holmes canon, and um, we've built him um, culturally into this, you know, great nemesis of Sherlock Holmes. And he's still alive, course, is he not? He's still with us. Well, well, I, I would like to think that you know, since since Sherlock Holmes never lived and thus can never die, then the same goes for well, Professor Moriarty. Moriarty. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But um, you know, canonically speaking, he got he was the one who ended his days um uh at Reckenbox Ball getting tossed off a waterfall. Yes. But you know, he's he's as he's as alive today in our hearts, I think, as <laughs> as Sherlock Holmes is. Yeah, what is Lindsay, what is this um this game that uh, Sherlockians play about um, uh, Sherlock um having lived and living today and and same as Dr. Watson and actually Watson since he is the narr narrator in this in the in the stories he was the writer, right? And Arthur Conan Doyle was merely the agent. I mean, what is the whole construct Absolutely. of that? Yeah. Yes, well, that's called the Grand Game, and um, and it is based on the absolutely real and entirely true premise that um, that Dr. John Watson was Sherlock Holmes's biographer, and he required a literary agent, and that literary agent's name was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and uh, Doyle ha had 
Watson's stories published in the Strand magazine, which leads to all sorts of other, um, you know, wonderful speculations and what we call the writings about the writings. So, <laughs> uh, essentially, never has so much been written by so many for so few, we like to say, mm -hmm. um, because there are so many articles um, that people have penned to do with, you know, um, these questions that arise from the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. There are so many gaps in our knowledge. Um, where did Sherlock Holmes go to college? What was his childhood like? Where was Watson really wounded since um, his bullet wound seems to wander in a couple stories? Yeah. Um, Right. So we have a lot of questions about these things, and um, and the premise of, of posing these questions um, all is predicated on on the fact that Dr. Watson was um, yeah. was the author of these stories, and that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, bless the man, had them published in the Strand for Watson. And speaking about uh, who wrote what, um, we I I have to chide you for breaking one of the central rules here at our show. You mentioned that you're a writer, and you did not fully plug your writing. So <laughs> oh my goodness, I, I urge you to do so now. I mean, what have you? <laughs> written? How can we get it? How can we read it? And just tell us a little bit about that. Well, my first novel actually is called Dust and Shadow, and that um, that was a Sherlock Holmes pastiche that pitted Sherlock Holmes in a very sort of gritty and real and kind of Caleb Carr-esque way against Jack the Ripper. I studied a great <laughs> deal about the uh, Jack the Ripper murders. So um, uh, that, one, uh, that one came out in 2008 from Simon & Schuster, and since then I have written the Edgar-nominated Timothy Wilde trilogy that was um, published in 14 languages to date, I think. Um, and then recently uh, Jane Steele, which is essentially Jane Eyre meets Dexter. Um, if you were to reimagine Jane Eyre as a as a heroic vigilante serial killer, um, that, that would be Jane Steele. Um, and most recently, um, the whole art of detection um, was a short story collection that I published because I have written so many. Um, Sherlock Holmes short stories for the Strand Magazine over the years and for various other anthologies that I finally had enough to um, compile them with editor Otto Penzler um, and put them together uh, for Grove Atlantic in a short story collection. So mm -hmm. uh, the paperback of that is going to be coming out um, in the spring of this year. Um, and my next novel, The Paragon Hotel, is going to be out um, like a year from now in January. I'm with Putnam. Um, and you have and a website that can, yeah, tell us. I do, yeah. You can find them. Uh, you can find them any place. Um, but I am um, Lindsay Faye, spelled a little eccentrically. It's l y n d s a y f a y e dot com would be the website, and uh, you can find all my stuff there. And the Baker Street Babes podcast is. The Baker Street Babes podcast is BakerStreetBabes.com, and we are very proud to say that we have well over um, a million listens, um, discrete, separate wow. listens, um, for our podcast. We have something like 50,000 Twitter followers, um, around the same number of followers on Tumblr, and um, and we love we love putting together um, as many Sherlockian projects as we can. Most re recently, the Babes also published a book our first book, and it is called Femme Friday. It is a collection of um, essays that we used to put out every Friday online that have to do with uh, female characters of note in the Sherlock Holmes canon and in other Sherlock Holmes media. Um, and you can find um, where to get that on our website as well. But, um, yeah, we are, we are <laughs> plugging away. That's and all great. the Sherlockian projects we can yeah. get our hands on. So. All right, great. Well, thanks for coming on. And the last, before I let you go, I just the last minute, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, just because I'm personally intrigued with this. The Baker Street Irregulars is kind of like, no one can go to this dinner. I was dying to go to this thing. i got to get in there. Uh, and, um, but, yeah, they, but, you know, what's it like? And, and as a person who got invested a few years, five years ago, whatever it was, what's it like to get, how do you get to be a member? I mean, uh, you'll have to do it quickly, but how do you get to be a member? Sure. And then what's it like, you know, after dinner, you're, you're waiting. You may have gone for years to this thing, being invited, and you're never knowing sure. when only one man knows the Wiggins, which is the name of the head of the group, you know, Mike Whalen. Mm -hmm. And and uh -huh. suddenly they call your name as the latest. And what happens? You go up, and what do you get? You know, what is this? Is it like um? Um, it it, it is it is a very it is, is it a, a castle or what's where? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, uh, the Yale Club is certainly well appointed. <laughs> it's not exactly a castle. Um, we have the, the yearly dinner. Um, essentially, what happens is if you have um. If you have an area of expertise in Sherlock Holmes and Sherlock Holmes studies, it doesn't matter which area it is. Um, 
You just have to pretty much be a obsessed lot. with the subject. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, there's a very wide range of people who have been invested. Um, some of them are, say, for instance, librarians who have contributed um, a lot to the study of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, my friend Don Hobbs was invested uh, a few years ago, and he, um, up until he donated it to a library, had the world's largest collection of Sherlockian translations. So he had 70-plus, like, like, actually, just, dozens and dozens and dozens, I think maybe upwards of 100 different languages um, of the Sherlock Holmes canon and the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, uh, mysteries, which, which were amazing to look at. Um, I myself am a, am a, as I said, mystery novelist, so um, I was of note because I had published uh, a novel mm. uh, starring Sherlock Holmes. Um, and you also have to be a convivial person. I think that ultimately uh, Mike Whalen, he wants to invest people who are all going to get along yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, and contribute to the society. Um, and the way you really first get noticed is, is just by having a particular aspect of Sherlock Holmes that you love and that you cherish and that you really invest a lot of time in. Right. So then what's it like? Um, how, how do you get, how do you get your shilling? What's it like? They call your name. Um, is everyone huzzah? Well, that, what's is it like <laughs> Harry Potter-esque? What's it? It's actually quite lovely. So, uh, so Mike, uh, you know, at the end of the night, everyone's always waiting for the um, for the investitures to happen, and uh, Mike begins to describe an individual and, without saying who they are, and eventually, uh, people sort of catch wise to who this individual is once the biography goes on um, for long enough, and then he announces what their new investiture name is going to be, and what's uh, yours? And their actual name? Uh, I'm Kitty Winter. She is a wonderful character from The Adventure of the Illustrious Client. Hmm. So I think it's a nickname um, from the from the writings, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> he comes up with a name that he finds um, appropriate to uh, to the individual, and then uh, you get up and you walk up to the front of the of the podium at the Yale Club, and everyone is cheering, which is absolutely lovely. And you get your shilling, and you get a um, a certificate of membership with your investiture name, and you know it's all in pretty calligraphy, and it's it's very very nice. And For life, shake the hand right. of Wiggins, and um, and then go sit back down. So he tends to invest. Around um, between eight to ten um, people per year, and I'm very happy to say that uh, that uh, Maria, the the lovely um, individual from the Baker Street Babes, mm-hmm. uh, who was dressed as the Grimpen Meyer, yes, um, from Hound of the Baskervilles, she was invested, um, as you mentioned in your article. Um, she was invested uh, this last time, so it, it's really lovely. Um, and I, you know, I'm also glad to say that uh, that. There are many more female members at this point, and um, I think we're coming up to uh, to thirty percent uh, female members in the BSI now, right. which is just marvelous. Right. Especially because I met some some more senior uh, members who um, who told me about picketing the uh, all male dinners in the '60s, and that was you know out there with signs in the cold weather and miniskirts and oh, that type of thing. So yeah, that was absolutely. it's great that there's that was, the, that adven- that was the adventuresses. The adventuresses, yeah, that's great. So. BSI unfair to women. Let us in out of the cold. Yeah. When you uh, when you disliked something in the 1960s, you picketed it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so, okay. yeah that it's all due to them that you know we get invited to the dinner at this point, they and the way. Um, yeah. they are, yeah they paved the way for all of us, and okay. they're absolutely marvelous. And they're one of the only societies that is not an offshoot of the Baker Street Irregulars. Most Sherlockian societies are what we call a scion of the Baker Street Irregulars. They are um, societies that are in some way uh, approved and, and organized and sort of under the umbrella of the BSI, and the adventuresses are not, because the adventuresses yeah. formed... Um, in opposition to them, really. In a, yeah. Not in opposition, in but in right? sort of uh, in, in parallel, because, yeah. Um, yeah. because uh, they wanted to get together and talk about Sherlock Holmes, too. Yeah. And the Baker Street Babes also um, formed, uh, we formed all by ourselves. <laughs> okay, so Lindsay Fay, thank you for speaking so eloquently about the Baker Street Babes and their modern twist on Sherlock Holmes. Um, Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank so, you for having me. Thanks a lot.